Hello and welcome to the Sound on Sound People and Music Industry podcast with me, Sam Ingalls. I'm very pleased today to be joined by the founder and president of Arturia, Frederick Brun. Welcome, Frederick. Well, thank you very much, Sam. Hi, everyone. Nice to be with you today. Arturia, if you don't know, celebrate their 20th birthday this year, which is an amazing achievement in such a fast-moving world as music technology. So congratulations, Frederick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's, uh, it's been a journey, uh, but we're many companies, uh, of course, in this case. Uh, but yes, for sure, we're glad to be one of them. I wonder if we could start this interview by going all the way back to the beginning um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your background before you founded Arturia and what gave you the idea of starting the company. Yes, for sure. Um, so uh, at start, we were two friends. We were uh, in the same university here in Grenoble, which is in the southeast of France. And uh, I was studying computer, uh, I was studying sorry, physical chemistry and Gilles, my partner, was studying computer science. And uh, we were both in the same orchestra. This is where we met. Um, so... Um, you know, throughout time, we started discussing about uh, music and technology, and Gilles really was the one the most interested um, in that topic. He went after uh, this, uh, these university years to IRCAM in Paris, where, where he did a master's degree. And at the same time, I went also back uh, to Paris, where I came from, um, to work on something different. I studied law, actually, after uh, my engineering um, uh, studies. So the two of us met again in Paris while Gilles was at IRCAM, and uh, that was a point where he started working on a, a first uh, software um, called uh, Continuo, which was the name we, we, we gave it, uh, which was a sort of uh, reactor in a sense. You could create um, patches by connecting modules, oscillators, filters, etc. And that was all uh, done in uh, assembly so code was assembly and there was a, a layer of Java on top of that. So that was the start of the company because while uh, Gilles was working on that, uh, he was wondering what he could do with it. And uh, we were friends. I was willing to start a company. So eventually the two of us uh, started working on this. And uh, I, uh, I took, um, the, let's say, the more the business side of, of the work and Gilles uh, kept on developing Continuo. So that's a pretty ambitious product to start with, especially in the early 2000s. What did you learn from developing this product? Well, that was interesting because Gilles had, uh, had big ideas about that. It was really uh, some sort of, of um, uh, workshop uh, environment uh, that he created. So the assembly was uh, uh, compiled on the fly. So you will sort of uh, create your, your patch. And then there was a compilation to optimize really the way the code was working. And uh, from there, uh, really used uh, the, the the sound engine. Uh, it was a bit complex, and uh, to me, as I was new to this uh, industry, I, I was not a user at all. I, I come, you know, I was playing the violin uh, before that. Um, it was a bit intimidating, and um, I started doing some research. I went to stores. I went uh, discussing with um, importers back then in France, companies that were importing uh, different products. There was one called Coblo, and in these early days, there were several ones. Of course, Propellerhead was already. Uh, an important player, just like Steinberg and many other ones, um, and Native Instrument was there too, etc. And we looked really at the market, and uh, since I did not really see uh, the outcome from Continuo, we started working on uh, discussing and working on a, on a more um, consumer-oriented product uh, based on Continuo. So Continuo was the backbone of our first product that was called Storm, uh, and Storm was a Storm's ambition was to be uh, an all-in-one music studio allowing everyone to, to create music easily uh, and for limited costs. And uh, back then, that was still a challenge because products could be expensive. Access to studios were, uh, was still important to really make music, and, and they were expensive to, to really um, reach out to and, 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 and also rent, uh, and not so easy to understand as they are still today. So our idea was really to make music creation a bit more simple. So right from the beginning, you saw the potential of software instruments and synthesizers running as software on computers. Yes, that's what really um, uh, was very much part of, uh, of our vision at first. It was really this idea that uh, technology will make music creation accessible uh, to much more people, which eventually happened. 
Um, and we saw the same trends in other domains. If you, of course, look at, uh, for example, uh, videos and the way you can uh, create a video, edit it, etc. Uh, this sort of democratization happened in many domains, photography as well, or architecture. Uh, and, but we, 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 we saw, yes, indeed, that uh, um, software and, and technology will most likely uh, make uh, things different and, and, and allow people who are not necessarily uh, good with music theory or do not have access to certain um, instruments and products to, to make music by themselves. And that was really the goal of, of Storm. So if you look at the first version of Storm that was out uh, in the, I think, very early 2000, uh, the product was a mix of different cultures. So there were some parts coming from the sort of game industry. Uh, there was a sort of fun part to, to Storm. Uh, and I think I, was, um, I, I took a large part in, in setting the direction, which was not eventually so good because people wanted to steal something a bit serious to make music. Um, and some parts were quite advanced, so we had uh, time stretching in real time and pitch shifting in real time, which was quite advanced back then. Uh, there was Sonic Foundry Acid doing that already, uh, but we had a very good algorithm to do that as well. We had synthesis, sound synthesis. So Storm was really about software synths, as, uh, as you mentioned, but was also willing to go beyond. We already had work on effects. You could record yourself. Uh, you could... Um, also um, add certainty. We even had back then uh, a sort of scratch module that was inside the studio. So you could load samples on two uh, turntables and start scratching <laughs> while you were making music. Um, so it was quite fun to use and, uh, and we worked on that for a few years. Well, that's, a lot of that stuff is uh, features that we take for granted now, but back in 2000, 2001, that must have been very much ahead of its time. Yes, back then we, we had several challenges to, uh, to face. Um, one was the, the sort of uh, uh, doubt or um, people were not sure a computer could really uh, bring what they were expecting. So notably when it came to sound quality or, of course, uh, going on stage. Uh, back then we were doing a lot of marketing explaining that there was a, a sort of comparison that was possible between a real instrument and a computer with a controller. And uh, we were uh, to prove ourselves. So a lot of things were about, yes, look at uh, how much you can do in terms of polyphony or look at how much you can save in terms of money. So a lot of these companies, I remember uh, an ad from Propellad really showing that there were sort of garage full of gear and they were trying to explain that, you know, with reason you had uh, pretty much not the equivalent because of course you don't have the equivalent of hardware. Uh, with a, a software mimicking the hardware, but you had some things that in terms of benefits could be compared still. So we had all these to, to look after, and then there were, of course, the, the technical challenges because um, there were questions of CPU. Uh, we, have, we had to be very careful with that. Uh, there were a lot of conflicts on the computer as well because you could have your antivirus starting, so we had to, to look after the different threads. Um, and of course, uh, latency, polyphony, all those things were uh, much more at stake than they are today. Um, and then, you know, once the marketing and the technology, you still had to educate also the, the, the customers. So uh, we were selling our first products on uh, CD-ROM. I remember that. Uh, and when we came with the second version of Storm, uh, we only had a few hundred uh, customers. I don't remember exactly, maybe 350 and I remember we sent a free update to all of them. We, we made a CD-ROM we, and we, we put that in uh, 350 envelopes and, uh, and sent that to the, the early adopters of Storm. So it was really a different time, yes. Wow. And following Storm, Arteria probably became best known to most people in the music technology world for recreating classic synthesizers in software like the Jupiter 8 and the, the CS80. Um, once again, that must have been quite hard to convince people that that was actually possible and that these software instruments could sound like the hardware originals that everyone loved. Yes, that was a, that was a big thing for sure. Um, when we started working on the first uh, uh, software recreation of a classic synthesizer, that was the Moog Modular, um, and uh, we went quite early to Bob Moog himself and uh, introduced the idea. So he was a bit sceptical at first, and uh, uh, but he was very, very benevolent, very, very nice and uh, welcoming. Uh, and then I went to Asheville, I showed him an advanced version 
of the product. And he was really surprised by uh, the polyphony, what we could do really on the computer. Um, and uh, yes, we, we went through this sort of pattern with uh, a lot of, our, um, of the musicians we, we, we were trying to reach out to. Uh, but the good news still is that for many, uh, there's a link, a natural link, of course, uh, between music and technology. They are part already of this industry using, uh, and they've seen, they've witnessed uh, what happened. They had witnessed what happened uh, the, the past decades uh, with, uh, for example, sequencers and you know, a uh, certain number of things related to media, etc. So a lot of people were very open still to novelties and innovation. So I did not feel, I never heard actually anyone really having a lot of, of uh, critics uh, besides some natural ones you could expect on sound or stuff like that. Uh, but once they tried it, and when we came with Moog Miller V, that, that really, because we had also the endorsement of, uh, of uh, Robert Moog, um, and uh, also some very nice endorsement by other musicians such as Isao Tomita. Uh, we used to play the Moog Modular a lot, uh, but people like Klaus Schulze as well. They were quite thrilled to see what we could uh, do with, uh, with the computer and, and the software, and that helped us a lot to get um, interest and, uh, and some legitimacy with, uh, with the rest of the market. So there were challenges, but we did not really realize... Uh, um, what was really at stake when we were while we were working because we were working hard and we were quite isolated here uh, in France. We sent the products and uh, and just with those feedback, we felt that it was working quite well. Wow! And since then, Arturia has modelled most of the great classic analog synths and quite a few other keyboards too. Which of them was the most satisfying for you personally to recreate in software? I think the first one still have a special place in my heart because it was really, again, a lot of questions and a lot of pleasure to see the outcome. And, and what we realized back then was the need to really uh, make sure things were really done right. And, and I'm not saying we've always done everything perfect, but we, we're trying. But we realized that to be uh, really serving well uh, the musicians and to be uh, uh, successful, we had to reach a certain quantum of... Uh, of uh, uh, things when we come with a new product and uh, and really make sure that the sound quality is there, uh, the interface is really the best it can be, the ergonomics, etc. And this first experience, because we were quite demanding uh, back then and we had also to seek uh, uh, Bomog's approval, etc., uh, took us to this uh, this level of, uh, of um, expectations uh, with ourselves. And, um, and that's, that's something that I keep in mind as a moment that was important for the company to really um, learn and develop this culture of uh, being uh, careful with details, etc. Um, and then the other ones, I'm trying to remember which one was really um, unique. I mean, some of them have a special history for me uh, because, for example, yes, the Jupiter uh, 8 I met with Mr. Kakeashi. So to me, that was also an important moment. Uh, and um, that was also inspiring to have this discussion and showed him uh, what we were doing. Uh, so Kakeishi San was the founder of Roland and the, and the, and the very important figure at read his book. And that was also, uh, um, for me, a, a big source of inspiration. And then the other ones, right now, I, I feel, yes, all of them have something unique. When we have a story with the founder, uh, like in the case of the CMI, for example, or other ones, for sure, it's, it's adding some sort of emotional and, and, and we feel we are really, we have to make things really right. So as far as I'm concerned, this is, these are the ones I will, I will really uh, have in mind, but maybe developers here um, will, will think differently because they maybe have challenges that I don't remember and they are really proud of, uh, of what they've done. Hmm. As well as developing synths for macOS and for Windows, Arturia also makes soft synths for the iOS mobile platform. Are those basically sort of slimmed down versions of the macOS instruments, or do you need a different approach to designing an iOS instrument? Well, there are two, um, two different uh, uh, solutions we have on iOS. So one is just a simple portage of our, our existing software instruments. Um, and uh, for those, uh, it was a partnership with a company which was uh, and which worked with other uh, uh, companies in the industry, like Moog Music, for example, which was an Akai, 
uh, willing to port existing Mac and PC software onto iOS and get some royalties for that or pay it some way. So we saw it was interesting to be there. Uh, the investment for us was not huge, and we didn't know exactly what would happen with uh, iOS. Would a lot of people turn to this platform to make music? We thought it was wise to go there, so we, we run this development with them, but they are really the ones who, who ported really our software there, and the software is quite close to what you have on the, on the computer. Um, the difference now is that we keep on, on working on our existing software instruments. So with new, each new version of the V collection, we remake uh, a couple of engines when we think it's necessary because now we have more CPU, we know more, we're better at it. And we also bring improvements to um, the other ones that may not be as, as important as really reworking the engine entirely, but we still do some work. We don't do that on iOS because we don't have the mastering of the, uh, the software itself. And also because, to be honest, the uh, iOS solutions are not so successful for us. I mean, we, we did not generate much revenues for that, but we, from that, but we did not uh, also uh, work so much on that because we did not feel very engaged by the community. So uh, the iOS apps have been uh, a bit beyond for us. The second category, because I started with that, is uh, just um, uh, the iSpark app, which is uh, more advanced. There has been a lot of thought put into that because we felt that this product toward the iOS audience will, will have more success. And uh, it was important to really take uh, the most of the, um, the interface, the, the, the iPad interface, to really make sure uh, that musicians could do something with it. So this one is, is a bit different. Uh, but still, this is not a solution that we are uh, really maintaining a lot, to be honest. I see. And was it always the plan that Arturia would start to develop hardware instruments as, as well as software? Was that the plan from the very beginning? No, no. At first, we did not think we will do that. Um, that came really from the, the users. Um, and uh, early on, some, and we, we, we mentioned that some, uh, some users adopt about, uh, doubts about the uh, uh, the ability to take uh, software on stage. So we, we were receiving some uh, emails uh, from people saying, you know, we love your Mugmular uh, recreation, but can't you do a rag version of that? Um, can't you do a hardware version of that, etc." And uh, we were also at the time looking at uh, the way people were using uh, our software, and we understood that the mouse and the computer was, uh, was great, but we felt there was also a limitation. So we answered this, uh, this problem by uh, creating controllers, but we also felt that in some context it was better to have embedded uh, solutions. So we started working on that in 2004, um, and our first product, uh, Origin, came out in 2008. Uh, but the, originally we did not plan on, on uh, uh, embedding our software uh, this way. Had we known the difficulties, probably we would have... Uh, hesitated a bit more, but we didn't really know, so we embraced the project with uh, uh, some sort of enthusiasm. Uh, and uh, it took really you know, five years to get through um, Origin, um, and that was really, really, really challenging. And uh, eventually it's, you know, it was done, and uh, that helped us grow into a really serious, let's say, a hardware manufacturer. But uh, the, the, the beginnings were tough, yes, for sure. <laughs> Well, Origin was a pretty ambitious product to start with because it was a very comprehensive um, modular synthesizer, um, not a simple instrument at all. Yes, absolutely. I mean, Origin was really ambitious. The, the idea was first to port our software onto hardware, but then we realized that uh, just offering this software will not uh, be creative enough at that point. We started, we had to go beyond that. So we decided that, that Origin will be also a modular system allowing to um, mix uh, modules from the classic instruments of the past. So you could play uh, a CSAD oscillator with a Minimook filter, uh, add effects from another synth, etc. And offering that, uh, plus everything that we wanted to add, including sequencer and so on, uh, plus the template, the, the existing, the original instruments like the Mini-V or the Jupiter-8, etc., was really, really ambitious. So we worked on, uh, with some uh, hardware Tiger Sharks that gave us uh, enough power to do that well, enough CPU to do that properly. Uh, but eventually, it was so ambitious that we could never entirely develop the entire 
uh, concept. Steel Origin is a, I mean, still today it's, it's in use and a lot of people are, are really loving their Origin. Uh, but this is a product we work really hard on. It's been a very expensive project and we never really, here again, that's one case where we never really made, made up for all this, uh, this investment. But again, that was still a very good learning curve and it's still a very good product. It's, you know, we see sometimes pictures in studios uh, um, all over the world and people who, who have it really love this sound. Uh, but it was a genuine attempt to bring this sort of Frankenstein solution uh, to, the, to the musicians. Origin was a purely digital product, but then in 2012 you launched the Mini Brute, which was an analog monosynth. That must have felt like quite a big risk for Arturia as a company to take. Yes, that's true. I mean, um, we... We were, because we were recreating those uh, classic analog uh, synthesizers, we were understanding a bit of that market and those products. And uh, we were also feeling there was an interest from a lot of people for the hardware solutions um, beyond the radar. We felt there was a market for that. Um, and if you remember back then, only a few companies were still making analog uh, instruments. So yes. Uh, Dave Smith was back and uh, Moog, Moog Music. There were a couple of what they call boutique uh, companies uh, making products. Um, and we thought that if we were able to bring something that will be inexpensive enough, uh, singular enough as well, I mean, we had to bring a, a differentiation um, and not too intimidating, we could probably uh, reach, start to reach out to a, a larger number of people than, uh, than uh, you would think. So. Um, we, we, we started working on that and, and the project started a bit uh, strangely because we had uh, this very bright intern who arrived uh, in the summer and uh, we had this idea and we didn't re really know what to give him. And uh, his name is Daniel and, uh, and he worked, he started working on that. Uh, he started making renderings and, uh, and we had a couple of guys in the company who started working with him and after a, a couple of weeks we realized that what he was doing was really great <laughs> and we were all working with him on on the definition of what will become the, the Mini Brute. So we had some, some sort of uh, uh, strong decisions to make. For example, is it gonna be 25 keys, 37 keys, or 49, etc.? cetera? And uh, we decided, I remember that day when we decided to go with uh, this sort of square form factor, 25 keys only, just one oscillator, but very, very big and powerful and, and with access to pretty much everything. So you could really mix the, the waveforms not only select the waveform. So we decided to go with something quite simple and, and lean in a sense, but where we will really be strong with everything we will put in the, in the instrument. So just the Steiner Parker filter, um, which uh, eventually brought this very unique sound to the Mini Brute. And, and, and this sort of radicality in our design choices uh, worked really well. Yes, indeed. And the filter in particular is a very distinctive feature of the Mini Brute because many other instruments copy the classic Moog or sequential circuits. But you went for the Steiner Parker circuit, which hadn't been used for a long time. What do you feel is special and distinctive about that filter? Well, it's, uh, yes, it's, it's, some people think and see that the Mini Brute is, uh, is very aggressive, but I don't think it is. It's... Uh, it's um, the way you use the filter, it's it's quite versatile, and it's uh, um, you know the, the creamy ladder filter is 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 different from the Steiner that can be a, a bit more uh, edgy in a sense, a bit more radical. But if you learn how to use it, because there's also something we we brought this sort of feedback loop uh, uh, feedback into uh, the sound chain that we call the brute factor, um, and that's added to the to the. Um, to the standard Parker can create very amazing effects on sounds. It just calls for uh, some sort of, um, I would say, mastering of the beast in a sense. So you have to be careful on the way you use it. Uh, but yes, the standard Parker character was was very important also in relation with the oscillator, the way it's been it's been done. And we've re we've reused it afterward on pretty much everything we've done uh, since then. So the Mini Brute Two. Um, for sure, but also uh, the Matrix Brute and now the Poly Brute. And when you mix then the Steiner Parker with the ladder filter, you see, you hear the differences. And uh, when you really have the two working together, you can really create uh, amazing things. So 
yes, we thought we will be a bit more radical, a bit more edgy with the, the Steiner Parker, but we felt also that the industry needed uh, something different than another uh, letter filter recreation uh, inspired by uh, Moog Music. The Mini Brute and the Micro Brute were quite small and affordable instruments, but then you built on those to make the Matrix Brute and now the Poly Brute, which is an amazing instrument. Is that a move that was um, driven by your users or is that coming from your own personal sort of desire to have these instruments available? No, I think it's a mix, but it's, I think in this case it's more us. I think feeling that we wanted to do uh, something a bit more ambitious, the first time with the Matrix Brute, um, and then with the Poly Brute, for sure users have asked for an analog polyphonic uh, synthesizer, so we, we have uh, listened and, uh, and we're following their, their request. But this is something of interest to us. So the Moog Modular, uh, sorry, not the Moog Modular, the, the Matrix Brute, the, the idea was to... Uh, to, to see um, if we could create a sort of modular with presets. Um, and it was, uh, I don't remember when we started working on that exactly, but modular instruments were uh, growing as a trend. And um, we were still very much in love with the Moog modular. Um, and we were wondering, is there a way you could uh, have the best of those two worlds in a sense, have presets and at the same time have the pleasure of patching, uh, really having your, your chords and so on. Um, and we could not find something working really, but this is when we, we had the idea of the matrix uh, and the way uh, it's done really, we feel allows to have really a lot of the benefits of, of really preset for sure and, and the modular aspects. So you can very quickly create your patch in a, in a sort of physical, um, let's say a sensitive way as well with this, this, this matrix. And that came really from this idea and everything derivated from there. I mean, we could use the matrix we realized for other things like a sequencer, uh, of course, for recalling presets and not only for setting modulations. And um, that, that was an important moment for us uh, because we felt we, we loved also the matrix 12, which is such an, an amazing uh, synthesizer. But um, the user interface, uh, we felt could be in some cases um, uh, a, a, a bit hard to, to first understand, but also to use on a, um, uh, on a daily basis. So we, we, we were really happy with the ergonomics of the, of the matrix uh, in the matrix brute, and we reuse that in the, in the poly brute, as you saw. Wow. Well, I think you've succeeded in creating something truly desirable in those instruments, and I'm sure there's not a synth fan in the world who wouldn't want to get their hands on a matrix brute or a poly brute or even both. Um, but another direction that Arteria has moved into in the last few years is computer audio interfaces with your audio fuse range. Uh, that's quite a competitive market, and there's a lot of established names out there making very good products already. Has it been a challenge to break into that market? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And I don't know if we've really done it yet, but uh, we are we're working on it. We are trying to make really the best product we can. Um, why did we, we make that move? Um, there are, again, it's a combination of different things. Uh, we were looking at the history of synthesizers and we saw those uh, trends back in the 60s, 70s, 80s where people really were fond of uh, analog synths and uh, then digital synthesizers came out and then suddenly the, the synth uh, market went down. Uh, people were moving onto guitars and that was a time also where a lot of company uh, disappeared. So that's when, you know, Moog Music the first time was, was sold, but then some way uh, faded away. And then Dave Smith's instruments, uh, pro, uh, sequential, sorry, ba back then in the, in the 80s or 90s, I don't remember exactly. So a lot of companies um, that were doing synthesizers uh, had trouble. And um, looking at this history, um, we were feeling that we had to be careful um, and that, you know, musical trends and things can change. So we had to also see if we could be on other segments of the market. So this is when we, we looked at what we could be doing. And audio interfaces were of some interest to us because we always felt they were an important part of the experience uh, we are bringing with our products. We have software that needs to be uh, carried out in terms of audio onto speakers or mixing tables. Uh, we had hardware that had to be recorded on the computer. So this piece in the center was um, was very important, and, uh, and uh, we felt we some way belonged there as well. Uh, and last, we also had an opportunity 
from uh, another um, from another company uh, which is uh, which was very uh, close to us, which is called Digigram, and we started working on the first product, AudioFuse, along Digigram to make sure um, we could bring um, something unique to the market. So again, this is a case where when we saw the intra the opportunity, we were really thrilled. We we thought you know we can do something different, and uh, instead of really being a bit more wise, maybe we said well, let's do it. Let's let's see what we can make that will some some way, and it's maybe a, a bit daring to say, uh, but change this uh, this approach to, to, to audio interfaces. What could we make so people consider their audio interfaces as instruments in a sense um, and are more empowered by the audio interfaces and not uh, feeling slowed down by, you know, going through a menu, dialing with this one uh, wheel. Uh, onto certain things, going back, etc. So we really wanted to to challenge the status quo on this, um, and we made AudioFuse, and then AudioFuse um, Studio, and then uh, AudioFuse 8 Pre. I think it's another order, AudioFuse 8 Pre, and we are going to keep on working on that. We are very happy with the feedback we have from uh, from users, uh, and we we're going to keep uh, going in that direction. Wonderful. So twenty years on, Arteria are now a major company in the music technology world with a very broad product range from tiny little controller keyboards and iOS synths all the way up to the magnificent Polybrute. Is there a common Arturia DNA that runs through all of these products? I mean, what do you think makes Arturia products distinctive and stand out? Yes, I, I think there is. I mean, we, we, we see, um, again, musician in the center, in the sense, we see really first this physical relation to the instruments. Um, I mentioned that recently, but I was a violin player, and uh, in the company we feel this gesture, um, uh, touching the knobs, turning knobs, uh, really uh, using instruments as instruments, not as systems where you will, again, uh, have drop-down menus and, and, and spend time on settings, etc., but have this more physical relationship uh, with some sort of uh, sensitivity, I don't remember the exact word, but where it will be based on sensation. So if you look at Polybrute, it's, it's showing that quite well with the uh, ribbon controller, with the Morphe, the roughness beyond your finger, the way you can turn knobs. The screens are small with our products because we don't want people to focus on the screens uh, so much, but really have the same approach you will have with a more traditional acoustic instrument or the approach you had with uh, with a Minimoog or, um, you know, a Verlitzer, or, or Fender Road, etc. So again, there is something uh, uh, very much emphasizing the emphasize on the body experience uh, is, uh, is, I think, uh, core to what we're doing. And that's the same thing with our audio interfaces as well. You have a lot of control uh, to do not be stopped in your creative flow. Uh, you find that also in our Keystep line, for example, uh, where you don't find a lot of screens, but you find everything you need to quickly do uh, what you want. Um, another aspect is in the integration between software and hardware, because as you said, this is our history. We came from the software world. We're doing hardware as well. So we think we can offer a combination of the two that is uh, uh, fulfilling and that's uh, empowering and taking um, you know, music creation a bit further. So this is something you find and you will find uh, even more uh, with our future products. Um, and I think there is also a relation to time because we started by recreating classic instruments. There is this sort of uh, uh, respect and attention to the legacy and from there build something new. So not be uh, sort of uh, constrained by the historical paradigm. So when we do, for example, a software recreation, we are true to the original, but we don't want to force uses that will not be relevant today. So there is this sort of balance between Again, tradition, history, and, uh, and, and innovation uh, that we try to, 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 to make the best. And looking to the future, finally, what do you think musicians want from Arturia in the years to come? Mm, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I think we, we, we should still work on making sure uh, our products sound really good um, and work well. Our, easy enough to use. Uh, so when you come back from work, if you are not a professional musician, you may want still to open your computer or turn on your, your hardware synths. Um, I think integrations between all of them will be more important. So when you have one, you can do more with the other ones and you feel that 
uh, and that's a word everybody uses and I've been using in this in, in pretty much all industries now, but creating this sort of ecosystem in a sense between products and open also to other products. So we're, we've been always keen on making sure products were compatible with the other products in the industry. Uh, so we are NKS compatible, for example, uh, and, and we're trying really to make sure our controllers work well with all uh, those uh, digital audio workstations. So again, making sure work, products work well together, integration, taking the best of software and hardware, making sure in all situations you can be really working the way you want. Should you have hardware, you may have it. Should you be in a situation where you want to work on your computer without any sort of hardware controller or anything, you can, etc. So this versatility will be very much core to what we're doing. And we see you know, new options for uh, really outreaching to a new generation of musicians who are wishing to learn and can work with us on, the, on that. And do you think new technologies like MPE and MIDI 2.0 will come to be more important? Yes, I think they will. I mean, we've uh, always been careful because throughout time we saw many, uh, I don't remember all of them, but uh, what was it? Uh, different technologies came out, so we were always a bit careful, but we are going to support MPE uh, more. Uh, MIDI 2.0, yeah, we're you know, looking at it and, and we'll for sure support um, uh, as much as we can. Um, we think that, yes, the link between controls and, uh, and generation of sound is very important. You can find a lot of options for controls now, and uh, you can do so much, and even I think we could do more, but you can do a lot in terms of sound generation. And this link between the two remains one of the key questions. How can you really uh, do what you want? And, uh, and uh, yes, MP for sure, MIDI 2.0 will help. We can invent also new ways of, uh, of, uh, of, in, of this, making this interaction uh, efficient. Well, it sounds as though that question, how can, we, how can you do what you want, is, is at the heart of Arturia's thinking on almost every product that you make. Yeah, we, yes, we're trying really to put ourselves in the shoes of the users. Um, I'm, I'm myself also always looking at the, the, the beginners, the first time users. So I'm the one who's advocating this customer who's new to this industry because this is what I was at first. I remember uh, looking at the back of uh, some um, boxes, uh, so software boxes uh, back in the late 90s and wondering what is all that and trying to understand. I remember even rem the day where uh, I talked with Gilles, my partner, about synthesizers, and I was really new to that, and I was not getting what a synthesizer was. So I was asking, uh, what does that mean? Is this synthesis like you will summarize a sort of longer document or you will make something shorter out of difference? It's a synthesis, is a, is a sort of sum up of different things. And, and Gilles told me, no, no, this is more synthesis as you will find in the pharmaceutical industry. This is like synthesizing a molecule or something like that. You Out of nothing, you will create a sound. In this case, out of maybe a, a, a voltage or a, a electric signal. So I remember those days where it was really hard. And I'm always feeling that even for advanced users, the, the goal will be to, to offer instruments that are as simple to understand as a piano and as expressive as a piano. And that's one where you feel it's just infinite to, to play and, and, and enjoy and, 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 and transmit what you want to express. And at the same time, you won't spend hours on, on any manual, whatever. So if we could do that, that will be great, <laughs> even if, of course, it's a challenge. Well, I think we'll all say amen to that. And I'm sure everyone who's listening to this podcast will join me in wishing Arturia a very, very happy 20th birthday. And here's to the next 20 years. Frederick, thank you so much for your time today. It's been wonderful to talk. Um, have a great week and talk to you soon. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you uh, to all of you readers and users. Uh, we'll do our best to, to keep up. Bye-bye. Merci. Thank you for listening, and be sure to check out the show notes page for this episode, where you'll find further information along with web links and details of all the other episodes. Oh, and just before you go, let me point you to the soundonsound.com forward slash podcasts website page, where you can explore what's playing on our other channels. Music